we should have been moving it quick. Yeah. Well, the order is given to fire. Who fires first? Front rank. Front rank. The front rank man. Commence. Fire. Bang. Bang. While the front rank man is reloading his weapon, and rear rank man, what are you doing? You are picking out a target. You are aiming at your target. When your front rank partner tells you he is loaded, you will discharge your weapon. Loaded. Loaded. Bang. Uh, let me think for a second before you do that. All right. That's probably the best way to describe this book. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that means so many things. I just can't pick mm -hmm. one. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll edit it. Tell me when. When? Hi. Right, my name is Bob Hutton. I belong to the 14th North Carolina. Um, I belong to the 67th New York from 2005 to 2010. It was a pretty good unit, very authentic. Um, we had some really good times. We belonged in the front guard. We uh, drilled, drilled well. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I wanted to do some Confederate, and um, I left on good terms to do that. Some of the best, um, one of the best times I've ever had was, well, two of them exactly at Gettysburg. When the Mifflin Guard uh, did the Ranger program at the Pennsylvania Monument, we did Willard's Advance one year, which was very interesting and also explained a lot uh, historically to me by doing it. We also did the Charge of the First Minnesota. The interesting thing about that was they gave us all slips of paper to show what 80% casualties were. Mm -hmm. I believe there was a hundred of us, or close to that, or I could be, but something like that. And when you see 80, 90 bodies laying on the ground, it, it's a lot. And you multiply that by 7,000. I'll wash it. Here, it's about five. I guess I'm done. Okay. Uh, all right, well, Mr. Hutton, we, we thank you, and uh, do a video selfie. All right, thank you, Mr. Hutton, even though you are with the dark side right now. Uh, but we certainly uh, we have very fond memories of you, too. And I have very fond memories of the 67th New York. <laughs> Forward, march, guide to the left. On 33 weekends this year, from April 1st right up to November 1st, uh, we here at the park invite onto the battlefield some of the finest groups in the nation to present life of the Civil War soldier programs to you folks. Uh, groups like the uh, 3rd Virginia. Uh, we have presently about 68 different groups uh, comprising of over 2,000 individuals. They're invited over the course of April 1st to November 1st on those 33 weekends and the 3rd Virginia's weekends this weekend, and they are typical of all the units that are invited to Gettysburg. These men have traveled long distance, they spent their own money, and they've given up this weekend, and they did that for you folks. 
And without our volunteers, we couldn't offer 33 weekends of living history. There'd be no April 1st and November 1st. There'd be no life of the Civil War soldier programs held on this battlefield for you folks to enjoy. So, maybe we just take a moment of our time, show our appreciation to the 3rd Virginia for giving up the Here's time to demonstrate the role and function of the infantry soldier when it comes to the weapons and tactics of the infantry. You're going to see how these men were trained. You're going to see how they formed up those double rank lines and pop the tactics. In the course of the program, they're going to be demonstrating the most important piece of equipment for an infantry soldier, and that's his Springfield or Enfield rifle musket. Now, they will be firing these muskets for you. Park regulations are quite clear. We fire historic weapons on the park, we just don't live fire historic <laughs> weapons on the park. So there won't be any mini balls flying down range, ricocheting off the rocks and the trees and taking out these buses and things that come down the road. But we are going to blank fire each man about 60 something grains of black powder and blank loud. It's going to be a little loud. So if you have a hearing aid, turn that down a little bit. Also, if you want to protect your hearing, so you can cup cover, plug up your ears, that should do the trick. You can go home with all your hearing. Finally, one more thing for your own safety before we begin. Black powder, it is considered a Class A explosive. It's highly dangerous, it's very volatile, it's very highly unpredictable stuff. The men of the 3rd Virginia are trained and experienced in using that black powder safely. But here in the Park Service, we're looking after your safety. That's paramount with us. So we want to separate you folks from any of the potential problems that do exist when you have your fire class A explosive. Once again, don't anticipate any problems with the man in the third decade. Or one of the safest groups in the nation with that black powder. But you never know, problems can happen even with the safest groups. So in case there is a rare problem out in the field with that black powder, you're going to be safe and separated from that problem. And we do that by the means of this very expensive barricade. <laughs> so you can come on up, get nice and close, put your belly right up against that barricade, but just do not go beyond it uh, during the course of the fire demonstration. Uh, when uh, all the muskets are unloaded and safe, uh, the men will be marching back over to the shade of Pitzer Woods. Uh, they're going to be, uh, they have quite a long way to go. They'll probably be preparing and loading up a little bit. But uh, they should spend a little bit of time. If you have any questions, they'll spend some time with you, answer most, if not all, your questions that you have. So uh, spend a little bit of time with them back in the shade after the program. I'd like to thank you folks for coming out and supporting our living history when you do. Good groups like the Third Virginia are invited back every year. It's been many, many years, probably 20 years plus, that I've worked with these gentlemen. And every weekend that I've spent with them over the years, how uh, the Third Virginia has always made my job with them very low key around here. So to introduce you to the weapons and tactics of the infantry soldier. I'd like to introduce you to a gentleman who's very instrumental in bringing the 3rd Virginia onto this battlefield. He's extremely knowledgeable about the role and function of the infantry soldier. going to share some of that knowledge with you. I'd like you all to meet my good friend, Mr. Chris Steen. Thanks, Doc. Thanks all for coming out here. Give you a little taste of what the Confederate soldiers were like here in General Lee's Army here at the Battle of Gettysburg. The men of the 3rd Virginia and Company A, the Dismal Swamp Rangers, which we're doing today, came from a place called the Village of Deep Creek. A village is exactly what it was 150 years ago. Not very many people, but they coughed up enough people to form their own company. And so the Dismal Swamp Rangers became part of the 3rd Virginia Infantry, and they took place in the action here during Pickett's Charge on the third day of uh, that, the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, attention, Company. That pulled, right? A little bit about the gear that these men have on, have a, have about here before you. Uh, he's got on a pretty stout pair of shoes and a decent pair of uh, pants and trousers. He's got a, a nice little slouch hat on top of his head. Uh, if you compare him to the rest of the guys back here, you see uh, almost nothing matches from one soldier to the next. And that was pretty typical of the Confederate Army. They had stuff that worked, just none of it matched the other guys. 
in comparison to the, to the federal troops that you might have seen earlier today or later today where everything looks pretty uniform from one man to the next. He's got here from the front of his head a cap pouch where he keeps his, uh, a small handful of percussion caps which are used to ignite the weapon. Go ahead and turn to the left point, please. Back here on his hip, he's got a cartridge box which keeps 40 rounds of ammunition. Go ahead and right take to the rear. Knapsack for keeping any of his uh, personal items, his bedding, uh, any extra gear that he carries along. He's got a, a cup down here attached to his haversack where he keeps uh, any leftover rations that he might have or any personal items that he doesn't want to drop. Very often soldiers uh, took their knapsacks and bedrolls and left them to the side because they can get in the way out in the battlefield. Got a canteen for a supply of water. Rotate again for me, please. A scabbard for his bayonet and back to the front. Most importantly, the most important piece of gear that all these soldiers have is their rifled musket. Hold on. Every one of these soldiers is outfitted with either an Enfield or a Springfield rifled musket. It is the long arm technology of the period. This was the best that there was. And for, the, for most of these soldiers, uh, they started off this war with a wide variety of, of long arms. But at this point, it's pretty much been whittled down to uh, Enfields are being imported from England or Springfields are picked up from the battlefield or some of, of a handful of other manufacturers throughout the South that also made, other, that made uh, long arm weapons. It's chambered in about a 58 caliber round which fires a bullet about the size of the end of your thumb. Each one of these soldiers was pretty much a civilian before, uh, before the war began. You might have had one or two uh, out of a company that had been part of a, a militia unit or maybe had some pre-war experience, but the average Civil War soldier is a 20-year-old farmer. You also had carpenters and mill workers and textiles and students and merchants and things of that sort, but most of these guys, they had absolutely no soldier training, and they spent the first good portion of the war drilling, trying to find out what some of the skills were that it took to be a soldier that by this time at Gettysburg, they had certainly mastered. And we're gonna show you a little bit of the manual arms, which is some of how the way they learned to handle the weapon. Attention, company. Shoulder arms. The shoulder arms was the way that the soldier typically carried the weapon when he was on any one of his guard duties or when they were on the march down the road. Right shoulder shift, arms. The right shoulder shift is a way that the soldier perched that weapon up there so he had the, his other hand, it's pretty free. The weapon's not being encumbered down by his hip. And though it looks kind of awkward perched up there, the soldier can run, he can jump, he can hurdle small obstacles like the berm out there. Uh, his wounded companion stall streams and get quickly from one place to the next on the battlefield. Shoulder, arms. Support, arms. This weapon is pretty heavy. It's a bit more than 10 pounds. Uh, if you're marching with that all day long, it get pretty, uh, pretty tiring on, the, on that arm. They put it in the other arm, uh, across the arm across it there, and that's a, a little more comfortable way. It gives him a little bit of time to relax. Uh, while he's still uh, engaging his march and he's not having to drag his weapon down the road. Shoulder, arms. Arms, port. Arms port might be used during guard duty when challenging. It can be used when moving quickly across the battlefield. It's used by the rear rank when they're in a bayonet charge, so they're not trying to project a bayonet through the, through the rank of the man in front of them. Shoulder, arms. Present, arms. Present arms is a formal salute that might have been used during parades or generally or one of the other dignitaries comes by and uh, they'd be offered a, a formal salute. Shoulder, arms. Order, arms. The most important portion of the manual of arms that soldier had to master was how to load this weapon and get it ready for discharge. And that's called loading in nine times. I'm going to show you what those nine steps are. Tension, company. Prepare to load in nine times. Load. Weapon goes to the load position. The right hand goes back to the cartridge box. Handle, cartridge. Cartridge is a paper tube about the size of your finger. It's got a bullet in one end and a charge of black powder in the other. Tear, cartridge. By tearing open that tube, they've exposed the black powder. Charge, cartridge. The powder is poured down the barrel. The bullet is pushed into the muzzle. Draw, rammer. These are a muzzle-loading weapon, so each and every shot requires the use of a ramrod. Ram, cartridge. Return, rammer. At this point, the weapon is still a 10-pound club. Last thing they have to do is prime. The weapon comes up over the cap pouch. They take one of the small percussion caps out of the cap pouch, put it on the cone. Weapon's now ready to fire.
shoulder, arms. A well-drilled, well-trained soldier is able to execute all of those steps, aim and discharge his weapon three times a minute. Attention, company. In two ranks, right, face. Forward, five files, right, mark. Five files, right, mark. Company, halt. Front. Order, arms. Unfix, bayonet. Of course, out in the battlefield, they would not be given step one, Handle cartridge. Step two, tail cartridge. They're going to be given a single order. That single order is load. The order load, each soldier is going to go and execute all of those steps as quickly as they can in order to load his weapon, bring it back to the shoulder, be ready to fire. The first thing that we're going to show you is something called skirmish order. The Dismal Swamp Rangers were sent out in front of the 3rd Virginia as skirmishers during Pickett's Charge. And what skirmishers are, they're kind of like antenna out in front of the bug. These guys were out in order, uh, more than 100 yards in front of the main body. The formation is spread out so it makes them harder targets. Skirmish is designed to find out where the enemy is, maybe break down some obstacles that might be in the way, uh, force the Federals on the other side maybe to put out their skirmishers, but it gives the main body back here a little more time to get ourselves into place because these masses of men are tough to move around the battlefield. Shoulder, arms. Company as skirmishers on the right file. Take intervals, march. The skirmishers go back and go out and they're comrades of four and they're going to get intervals between themselves so that when they get the order, when the order is given to halt, they've got room to deploy. Halt. The soldiers are going to spread themselves out and make themselves a harder target. If there's any obstacles, if there's any uh, uh, shallow spots, if there's any rocks or trees or bushes, they'll try to conceal themselves, make themselves a harder target to shoot. Commence firing. The front rag men fire their weapons. The rear rag men are held in reserve. They're picking at a target, looking for somebody to pop up his head on the other side going, what was all that out there? While the, while the front men, this is, this is not designed to be high speed, high volume combat. It's to put a few rounds downfield that, to cause the enemy now, they've got to deal with these guys out here. Put out their own skirmishers, drive them off. Cease fire. When I'm done with my skirmishers, they're in my way now because now I've got a federal, these guys, skirmish line is not designed to deal with, a, with a, a significant mass of line infantry. So I've got to get them out of the way. Assemble on the captain. Now that the skirmishers are out of the way, the rest of the line infantry can get involved in the action. There are many different ways in which line infantry could deliver fire. Probably the most prevalent during the American Civil War era was fire by files. A file is one man in front of the next. This is a file of soldiers. This is a file. This is a file. This is a file. You have a front rank and a rear rank. You have the rank and file organization of the army. Fire by files, pairs of soldiers will fire uh, individually, then the next pair, then the next pair, then the next pair. Company, fire by files, ready. Commence firing. And that ripples on down the front, the next file, the next file, the next file, the next file. The company next to me is doing the same thing. So you've got this ripple firing all across the company front. On the other side, somebody's shooting at you. It's not a lot of volume of fire at one time, but if somebody's shooting at you, you almost have to do something about it. You duck, you pause, you, you become a little concerned. Cease fire. Firing by file is useful because it helps me get fire out quickly. I can still maneuver soldiers on the line while, I'm, while, while these guys are starting to put fire down. But if I need a little more oomph, I can do something else. Fire by rank. Company, ready. 
Rear rank. Aim. Bop. Load. I've discharged half of my weapons. The front rank is now held in reserve. Just like they alternated on the skirmish line, they all, the ranks are alternated here. Half my firepower is kept off, and suddenly I have an opportunity out there. A uh, federal company pops up on the other side of the cornfield. I've still got something held here that I can do something with. And I've still put down a fairly good volume of fire. This can be done at a company size, it can be done at a regimental size. Front rank, aim! And they'd alternate back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Certainly the one thing that you will notice is characteristic about these weapons other than the noise is what? Smoke. Smoke. <laughs> these black powder weapons, unlike today's modern firearms, uh, discharge an awful lot of, of smoke. That smoke is very obvious, not only to these guys, but to the folks across the field as well. When you start shooting at an they'll start they start knowing where you are. If you don't have a decent wind out there, that smoke can get in their way out here. It kind of lays towards the ground. These guys might not even actually being able to see what they're firing at. They're leaving up to the sergeants and the officers behind them to direct their fire. And then they point in that direction and they discharge. If firing by ranks, if I needed something that's a little more devastating, I'm going to give them a company volley. And that discharges all of my weapons at once. Company, aim. <coughs> Box. Load. Trouble is, now for the next 20, 25 seconds, I have no weapons at all available to shoot at some, at some opportunity or suddenly there's a rush in my flank. I've got nothing here for them. Uh, and Civil War combat was, is characterized by this fire 20, 25 seconds, fire 20, 25 seconds. Because this black powder is so dirty, it gets a, a film on the inside of the barrel. And then that, that smoke leaves that little film there. So each round, the, the barrel gets a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. Those rounds are tougher to ram down the barrel. The rate of fire slows down simply because they're so dirty. Aim. Fire. Prime. Priming is just going to be uh, discharging a percussion cap. Make sure there's no unburnt powder inside the barrel. Make sure the weapon is safe. Aim. Shoulder, arm. <laughs> Left wheel, mark. Company, halt. Order, arms. In place, rest. Arr. Ladies and gentlemen, the men of the Company A, Dismal Swamp Rangers, 3rd Regiment, Virginia Volunteer Infantry. They were part of Kemper's Brigade here, took part in, in Pickett's Charge. They were the skirmishers for the 3rd Virginia, and that probably saved them. They brought about 25 men here to the battlefield. During the, at the end of Pickett's Charge, they had one man who was slightly wounded in the hand. So they pretty much escaped unscathed, uh, and that's probably because they were the skirmishers, and they were away from that main body. So every once in a while, there is a, a good story. Ladies and gentlemen, unless you have any questions, thank you very much for your attendance this afternoon. Please enjoy the rest of the day. Now, if you all got any more questions, please come back to see us in the woods. I'm going to get yeah, these guys thank out of the sun. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're thank very you. welcome. Thank you. Attention company. Shoulder. Mr. Hutton rules. Forward, five files left, march. Five files left, march. 